Welcome to Scrubcast, where we take a closer look at the research happening at Stanford University's Department of Surgery. I'm your host, Rachel Baker. Thank you for tuning in to our annual Home and Day episode, where we speak with the podium and poster winners. In part one, you heard from Dr. Shauna Gadkar and Deshka Foster on the basic and translational side of science. Now we'll move into our clinical, educational, and health services research, starting with Dr. Vivian Ho. You are a rising chief resident this year. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's crazy. Residency flies by, but it's a good time. It's been a fun ride. Excellent. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Uh, Like your colleague, Shaunik, you also looked at aneurysms, but from a completely different perspective. Tell us about your project. Sure. It's a nice compliment. You know, Shaunik's very accomplished in the field of basic and translational science. I have a very more data science style approach. And so I used a national claims database of over 60 million insured patients to try to look at how often folks are getting screened based on federal recommendations for abdominal aortic aneurysms. So in 2005, the United States Preventative Services Task Force recommended one-time ultrasound screening for any male who's ever smoked between ages 65 and 75 we, we don't have a great sense of how often that's actually being done. Okay. And obviously that's a very important sort of public health intervention because abdominal aortic aneurysms are usually asymptomatic until they rupture, which oh. is a high fatality event. Got it. Yeah. I was going to say like, why, why would we get an ultrasound of, you know, the aneurysm, but that <laughs> sudden right. uh, rupture it's sounds sort of, awful. Exactly. It's sort of, fluctuates between these extremes where it's asymptomatic or extremely, extremely morbid. And so looking at a cohort from a decade of 2006, 2017, Mm -hmm. we basically looked at all comers 65 to 75 with a history of smoking and kind of quantified from a state level who was getting screened and who wasn't. Got it. And it turns out that in this cohort, it's about 40% or less of claimants are getting screened who are eligible for screening that seems really low that's less than half it really is um yeah it's it's a couple things that are a little surprising one is we've had some reports from more integrated care systems like the veterans affairs healthcare system and kaiser and they seem to be doing a slightly better job mm-hmm. they seem to be reporting rates that are more in the 70s range okay so even though those groups have reported there's a lot more work to do It's kind of a shortfall to see that in the more private sector that less than 40% of patients are getting the the sort of federally recommended care. The other side of that is that that care is always covered by Medicare and Mm -hmm. always covered by private insurance. It was part of the Affordable Care Act saying if this task force recommends aortic screening, then we have to cover it for insurance reasons. Mm -hmm. So it kind of suggests that it's more than just a like a cost perspective. You know, this is something that is covered by insurance mandatorily across the country and still only about 40% of folks are getting the right care. Gotcha. Well, so in this database, were you able to, I don't know, cross-reference where these patients who weren't getting their recommended AAA screenings, you know, why weren't they? Was it, you know, they were far away from their doctors? They were had jaws where, I mean, I don't know, 65 to 75 year old people doesn't seem like, you know, as people who can't get time off, any indications about why people weren't getting screened? Yeah. I think that's the great next question sort of posed by this project. We have some hints. Mm. So we stratified not only like what states were high performing, lower performing, but we also looked at the county level and whether or not people lived in a zip code that was considered to be close or far away from a metropolitan statistical area. Ah. And metropolitan statistical area is kind of like a long phrase for just saying roughly urban versus rural. It's about (laughs) the density of people living in your area. Folks who are living outside of a metropolitan statistical area, what we would like to say probably further from urban centers are less likely to be screened. And then interestingly, um, Folks who are a little more on the sicker range and have higher blood pressure, actually, or coronary artery disease, um, are more likely to be screened. So there are some folks who are sicker and thus more likely to probably land on their primary care physician's radar uh-huh. as needing screening. Yeah. 
But then if you can't get in the door, if your nearest care center is far away right. or you live in an area where there might not be a high density of doctors, I think it does reflect in the care. Got it. That makes sense. I mean, my dad had a triple bypass. He was a smoker. He went for his follow-up. That's when they found his triple A. And so that makes a lot of sense because he was sick. That's why they detected it. But also, you know, if you, you know, I know from trying to find a, a doctor, <laughs> it's uh so many of them are, you know, not taking new patients or uh, are far away or you can't get to them on, you know, the date and time when they actually have an appointment. So absolutely. I think access to care is sort of the elephant in the room mm -hmm. when you point out sort of care disparities and lack of guidelines adherence in this case. I'm sure primary care physicians would love to just sign folks up for every screening that they're eligible for. Right. But there have been some very insightful studies done in the UK and in Sweden where mm -hmm. There's a single payer system, you know, the government is sort of the center provider for healthcare, and they've reported sort of barriers to aortic screening that include, as we kind of mentioned, distance from the screening center, lack of availability for appointments that the patients can actually make, mm -hmm. um, and then also generally lack of awareness about abdominal aortic aneurysms. Uh. I think a lot of folks know about high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks know about coronary disease or know someone who has had a uh, coronary bypass, just as you mm -hmm. mentioned. But I think how much people know about aortic aneurysms and specifically the sort of idea that they're sort of silent until they're very, very loud. Mm -hmm. That sort of knowledge gap makes it, it's just another barrier to getting folks in the door to get screened. Because even if they're referred for screening, it might not be on the patient's priority list. Right. They're not so familiar with the disease. For sure. Well, so what are your next steps? I know you only have a year left and it's going to be your chief year, probably going to be pretty busy, but are you planning on doing more research into this topic? Absolutely. Actually, we sort of, this was the launch pad. This project was sort of a wake up call to us about just how much more needs to be done on a public health scale mm -hmm. and understanding how to improve abdominal aortic aneurysm detection on a population level. So this was sort of the study that made us realize, hey, there's a treatment gap here. There's a disparity that we're seeing. And in line with the discussion that we've had, it kind of birthed a lot of other secondary questions. So after this, we did two analyses that actually looked at the impact of how this policy was rolled out mm -hmm. in affecting abdominal aortic aneurysm diagnoses. So in men and women, the United States Preventative Task Force has made changes over the last decade and oh. how they recommend these screenings. Okay. So in men, for a while, they required that for your aneurysm screening to get reimbursed, that you had to have it done in the first year that you entered Medicare, and it had to be done with a certain type of physical exam. Oh, So these were sort of barriers yeah. that were actually lifted about six years ago. Okay, And we actually did a study to see whether lifting that barrier, making it easier for folks to get reimbursed mm -hmm. for screening ended up changing abdominal aortic aneurysm diagnosis rates and screening uh -huh. rates. So ultimately we found that afterward there, we used this thing, an econometric analysis called a difference in difference analysis. Uh -huh. There was actually an increase in the number of ultrasounds being hey. performed about 20%. That's great. Which is really interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, again, that's what you kind of want to see is that mm -hmm. a policy is sort of pushing the envelope and changing practice behaviors. But the converse of that is that there still wasn't really a detectable jump in how many aneurysms were being diagnosed. Oh. So we were getting more screening, but we're probably falling short on really impacting the clinical outcomes mm. of these patients. Okay. So it was kind of another, like a two steps forward, one step back kind mm -hmm. of thing where I think it's helpful to see how these policies trickle down and change patient care. But obviously as a vascular surgery provider, you always want more for your patient. Definitely. Um, but we also did the converse in women. For a long time, the United States Preventative Task Force discouraged screening against women or said we don't re recommend against screening it for AAA in women. Huh. But there's been a preponderance of evidence that women rupture their aneurysms at smaller diameters. Ah. And since women live longer, actually, there's mm -hmm. you know added risk that women have compared to men when it comes to aneurysms. And so they've, over time, started suggesting that screening women for aneurysms, there's just, it used to be recommend against and now it's insufficient evidence. So we kind of also looked at that policy shift, but it's a little more granular and we didn't detect any change in screening mm. or diagnosis. Of that. Okay. Well, I'm very interested to see what the outcomes are and I look forward to seeing some publications in the near future. Yep, absolutely. I think both of those projects that I sort of sneak peeked at are 
making their way through the journal circuit. So yeah, we're very excited. We're glad that there's interest in this work and, and getting it out there and known. Fantastic. So I'm asking everyone on this episode the same question, and that is, if you could give your younger self advice when you started this project, what would you say to you? Ooh, interesting. <laughs> I would say to be open to finding different results, not only results that are contrary or to your hypothesis, mm -hmm. but also just signals in the data that you could not have anticipated, mm -hmm. I think when you go in looking for just one thing or, or just having one vision about how the project can go, you kind of close yourself off to certain possibilities. Just let the data tell you what it is and um, <laughs> don't try so hard to search for a signal that's not there. I think that that's really when it boils down to having the right methods under your belt and making sure you're being careful with your statistical assumptions. Mm -hmm. But I think I came into this project really thinking that screening was something that was kind of liberally done, that we weren't really going to add anything mm -hmm. to the literature, but then having to find out that, hey, that there's a lot of work to be done and, and how can we provide some insight about who isn't getting screened, um, that kind of ended up being an opportunity that was not what we initially set out to do. So there's a silver lining to <laughs> making a hypothesis and having to junk it. <laughs> I love that. Can I can I put that on a shirt? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll buy one. <laughs> Sometimes I still need the reminder. <laughs> uh, well, is there anything else that you wanted to add um, before I let you go? I think I'll just echo that the Holman experience. You know, I've, I've been doing this since I think we started Holman, um, since I've been here for a while now. I started residency <laughs> in 2017. And it's just been a, a really great experience every year and a really cool way for us in our little research silos to get out and see what the other surgeons are doing. And so I just want to just reiterate my gratitude for getting to get involved every year because it's been just like growing and, and more exciting every year to attend. I agree. Hellman Day has become like my favorite event of the year. It tops like the Christmas party. <laughs> <laughs> Well, also, there's like these cool socks that were circulating. There. Well, uh, yeah. I was like, what are these socks? <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Last but certainly not least in our special Holman 23 episode, we have Dr. Kirby Yolorda, a rising chief resident in our general surgery residency program and future colorectal surgeon. What is it about colorectal that brings you joy, Kirby? Hi, Rachel. Thanks so much for having me. Colorectal is so much fun. I think one thing that really drew me to the specialty is the breadth of procedures that we do um, in colorectal. So you can have big OR days where you're doing J pouches or doing total abdominal colectomies. But there's also some like nice reprieve of like the proctology days where you're doing fistulas and things like that. So I really like the variety in colorectal. There's opportunity for big open cases and minimally invasive cases, robotic cases. You really get to do it all. And so I think that's the main thing that drew me to the specialty. Hey. Well, and I, I hear that we have a pretty good team seeing as it got Service of the Year Award for two different PGY years just this morning. Absolutely. Yeah, we have great faculty at Stanford. We're really lucky to train under them. Fantastic. Well, so and your Holman presentation was on colorectal. You looked at the survival rates of patients with advanced colorectal cancer and juxtaposed it against social risks. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. What? Give me a few examples of social risks. Yeah. So things like partnered status or annual income, the presence of health insurance, comorbidities, those are things that you kind of think of. We also did things like adult caregiving, um, mm. which is something that you don't often consider as you know, a social risk or perceived discrimination that people experience in their everyday lives. Got it. So I consider myself to be a strong, independent woman. I don't like to believe that my partner's status is going to affect my health prognosis, but you found that these seemingly little things add up, especially over time. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, there were some increase in morbidity and mortality when we looked at the individual social risk, but it really wasn't that market of a difference. But when we looked at the cumulative social risk, so people with social risk factors 
like partnered status and unemployment or, mm. you know, like education and high levels of perceived discrimination God. and, you know, low annual income. When you start to add those things together, it really starts to have an impact on uh, mortality for folks at five years. Oh gosh, that sucks. I mean, so what do you do with information like this? Now that you've figured it out, how do you help these patients? Yeah. So I think the next step for us is to identify like, why is this happening? And then are there things that we can put in place to help mitigate some of these social social risks and take some of these things off the table or lighten the load for these patients? For sure. I mean, so how are you planning on, I mean, are you extending this research? Are you planning on to doing more? We are, you know, we just applied for funding to grow this project. So <laughs> fingers crossed. We have some things in the works, but you know, it will take some time. Of course. Well, so if you could give your younger self advice when you started this project, this is something that I'm asking everybody on this show. What would you say to you? So if I could give my younger self advice when I was starting this project, I think there are a lot of nuances in data. We're trying to look at big picture and see how these social risks impact people um, and outcomes. But I think there are nuances within the social risks that are also helpful to look at. You know, there's granularity in terms of insurance and Medicare and Medicaid and different payer systems that I think moving forward in other projects that we can look at closer and can help extrapolate some of the results that we found. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this is actually your second time winning a Holman Award? <laughs> that is correct. I've been very lucky. <laughs> First time you were wearing a cast and presenting on crutches. Yeah, it's better this time when you can walk on both legs, I will say. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, as a two-time winner, do you have any advice to future Holman presenters on how to make a presentation that is kicking butt? Oh, that's kind. I think the biggest thing is research is not a solo endeavor. The only way I've been even marginally successful is because I have such an incredible team that I work with at the S. Fire Center and such incredible mentorship from Dr. Arden Morris, one of the colorectal surgeons at Stanford. She has shown me the ropes and has guided me every step of the way. So if I had any advice to pass on, it would be to make sure that you have a strong team and a really strong mentor who has uh, the same vision as you do. Fabulous. Anything else you want to add before I let you go? I can't think of anything. This has been such a pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity to, to talk with you about this and share our work. And that brings us to the end of another episode. If you like Scrubcast, we hope you'll tell your friends and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Scrubcast is a production of Stanford University's Department of Surgery. Today's episode was produced by Rachel Baker. The music is by Midnight Rounds. And our chair is Dr. Mary Hahn.